I'm an economist, and uh, the work that I've been working on related to the Belt and Road has uh, really been to do some quantitative assessments using project level data on China's outbound FDI projects. Um, I won't really repeat a lot of the motivations and debates over, you know, what's the motivations for uh, China's outbound FDI, other than to say, I think that um, beyond uh, a lot of the differing viewpoints, I think if we look at the data in a sensible way, maybe we can learn something about uh, what are the factors that are actually driving the investment flows um, if we are if we can choose appropriate variables and um, so we've done some analysis of the basic determinants of flows of China's outbound FDI across different countries both before and after the Belt and Road Initiative began and more recently we've been able to link the project level data to firm level data from China, firm registration data, so we can actually link individual projects to the ownership. So we can distinguish between projects by state-owned enterprises versus private enterprises. And that's actually very new results that I wanna spend some time on to show the quantitative evidence on how much the BRI uh, FDI is, is state-led. Okay, uh, so, some of the questions um, that we're examining uh, using this data, has the BRI initiatives significantly increased Chinese investment in BNR countries compared to non-BNR Belt and Road countries? And what are the determinants of how much different countries receive? And we can think of determinants, uh, factors being divided into different categories, kind of economic fundamentals, uh, resource abundance, which is, you could argue, is also a kind of a fundament, economic fundamental. Uh, cultural proximity, if there's large Chinese-speaking populations, and governance factors. Um, and we're interested in trying to examine whether the determinants of these flows have changed, actually, if we compare investment flows before 2013 and afterwards. And then um, the questions that use the new data on state ownership are trying to just document what share of the Chinese outbound FDI is coming from SOEs and how do the determinants of SOE investment differ from the determinants uh, of outbound FDI from private firms. And that maybe can get at some of these questions about whether they really are behaving differently or they are considering different factors in, in their actual decisions, not just what they say in a survey. Okay. So, uh, of course, China produ produces uh, data regularly on its outbound FDI to different countries. But if you look at the official data, almost all of the FDI, guy, FDI goes to Hong Kong or other tax havens. So it's not very useful, actually, for understanding the uh, distribution of FDI across different countries. And so uh, we compiled a data set of project level data, mainly from two sources. One is the global investment tracker kept by the American Enterprise Institute, and the other is a data set on FDI um, that's compiled by the Financial Times. And that data set focuses on greenfield FDI, so not so much mergers and acquisitions. Um, and we merge these data and we kind of reconcile them and do some, uh, some, correct, or some verification of their accuracy Actually, both of these sources spend time to verify. They basically look online at various types of media reports, company reports, government lists to compile the list. So it's a fairly ad hoc process, but then they do try to make an independent effort to verify whether these investments actually occur. But there's still a lot of noise in the data. So uh, since I am a person who cares a lot about data issues, if you think about the benefits of the project level data, the biggest benefit is that the project level data does record the final destination of FDI, even if it kind of first goes to Hong Kong or other tax havens, it really records where it ends up. And so that's really important for completeness. Um, and it also lets us disaggregate the FDI flows by project uh, characteristics, such as the sector, or now that we've been able to do it, link it to the ownership. Um, 
And uh, the, the limitations still are that it's still very noisy data. And so you see a lot of pretty big year-to-year -year fluctuations in the bilateral investment flows to specific countries, uh, which may be real, but maybe a lot of mismeasurement as well. And so that's the quality. So what do we find? This is just a description of the project level data. If you look at greenfield FDI, it increased much faster in Belt and Road countries compared to non-Belt and Road countries. It's a bit opposite for non-greenfield FDI, which is not pictured, that that tended to increase more in the non-BNR countries. So uh, in developed countries in particular, there was a lot of M&A. And then you also see that construction projects, which is a separate data category um, in the AEI data, has been consistently much higher in the Belt and Road countries and has increased uh, steadily um, after the Belt and Road Initiative began. If we kind of do some uh, simple regression analysis to ask the question, how much has FDI increased in Belt and Road countries compared to non-Belt and Road countries and controlling, from, uh, controlling for the pre-trends in the FDI in both groups, then we actually conclude that Greenfield FDI increased by more than double compared to non-BNR uh, countries, Belt and Road countries, and construction projects increased by 17%. So the Belt and Road Initiative has definitely concentrated more Chinese investment um, in Belt and Road countries. And if you look at where the money is going, South Asia, Southeast Asia, the Middle East have received the lion's share of the outbound FDI and construction projects. It's also interesting looking at the sectoral composition in the period after BRI, you actually see an increase in the share of the FDI in resource related sectors. So it actually accounts for almost half of greenfield investments after the Belgian, after 2013. Okay, so uh, we do some regression analysis. Our dependent variable is just the annual FDI flow from China to different countries in different years from 2000, um, actually we do it from 2010 to 2017. This is a mistake. Uh, so roughly we have four years of data before the Belt and Road Initiative and uh, four years of data afterward. Um, and the economic fundamentals we look at are listed here. Um, not gonna go through them. We have a measure of resource abundance, which is the natural resource value divided by GDP, and then a measure of cultural distance. Um, and then we have this governance, these governance variables, this is country level data from the World Bank governance indicators. And uh, so various dimensions of governance are rated for every country in every year. And we can aggregate these into kind of a overall governance index, which is what we do. Um, we do regressions both with the overall index and then the components as well. Okay, so what do we find? Um, after the Belt and Road Initiative, one, one thing that we find very clearly is that the importance of economic fundamentals has actually seemed to decline in terms of the correlation between these fundamentals and where money is going to, across countries. And if you look at the lower left-hand figure, this is the coefficient on GDP per capita growth and its impact on the amount of greenfield FDI and construction projects. And you can see that the coefficients were uh, positive and really almost disappeared in the post uh, Belt and Road period. We find that the importance of governance quality actually increased um, in the latter period. So if you look at the second figure here, the overall governance index, uh, it's for FDI, it's significant both before and after the Belt and Road Initiative started, but it increases in importance. In construction products, it's actually not significant and it's even negative, which suggests that, you know, maybe construction projects are very corrupt and they seek out more <laughs> corrupt environments. And then finally, for the resources, uh, this is, you can see that um, they seem to drive construction projects more than greenfield FDI. So resource abundant countries get Chinese con uh, uh, infrastructure projects, perhaps to build access and to develop those resources. Okay, so 
Um, now, what about the data on the SOEs versus private firms? So this is just a descriptive table which looks at the aggregate uh, investment from SOEs to Belt and Road countries and non-Belt and Road countries. And by the way, the Belt and Road countries here are the original like 61 targeted Belt and Road countries. Now, of course, that has expanded. But these are ones that were initially emphasized. And you can see that um, for state enterprises, there is a big increase in Belt and Road countries, uh, the outbound FDI to Belt and Road countries. But what's really interesting here is among the non-SOEs, you see an even bigger increase. And you actually see levels of outbound FDI from private firms mostly, which is you know, getting very close to the level from SOEs. And the increase rate is greater for the non-SOEs. Um, and similarly, in non-Belt and Road countries, we also see a growing involvement of private firms in uh, these outbound investments. Okay, then if you look at where the money is going, so it's actually pretty similar for both SOEs and private enterprises. Uh, at, you know, ASEAN countries have been the most favorite destination for F outbound FDI and has increased for both SOEs and private firms in a similar magnitude. The scales here are different. So the private flows are actually less than the uh, state enterprise flows. And then there's been a big a surge in so South Asia as well. Um, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, um, et cetera. Um, and then, uh, so you do see another, another uh, region that's interesting is that Africa, you see this big jump in private. And here the Belt and Road countries it's only the East African countries. So uh, this probably reflects a lot of manufacturing investment in Ethiopia and maybe, you know, Kenya and Tanzania. Okay, so, and then finally, um, just to summarize, what are the kind of key differences between the SOE investment patterns and the private firm outbound foreign direct investment patterns? So one is that um, much of the increase in the outbound FDI in Belt and Road countries uh, has been from private firms compared to non-Belt. And even when we put that into a regression framework, it really jumps out pretty starkly that a lot of the increase in Belt and Road countries is driven by um, the private firms, which is interesting and I think begs a lot of questions about what kind of investment that involves. And then um, compared to SOEs, Private firm FDA, uh, FDI is consistently more responsive to governance, but the importance of governance to state owned enterprises is actually increasing under the BRI. So it's always important before and after for private firms and more important, but governance is matching more for SOEs over time. Um, which also is kind of, well, let me wait to the conclusion to interpret that. And then um, the last is that private firm outbound FDI seems to be more responsive to some other factors relative to the state-owned enterprise uh, investment, more responsive to cultural proximity, export sophistication, and distance. So some of these fundamentals. So it does seem a bit more uh, market oriented. Okay, so what do we take from all of that? I think, I think the patterns are interesting in their own right just to kind of document what's going on from the data, but um, one thing I take away that's important is that this declining importance of economic fundamentals does suggest that uh, there are definitely non-economic objectives that are motivating Chinese outbound FDI under the Belt and Road Initiative. And it raises concerns. I mean, if the money is going around for reasons that are not related to fundamentals, it's likely that the failure rate of these projects is gonna be higher if it were being driven by really commercial motives. And as someone, as a development economist, who's very aware of the long, poor history of the impact of foreign aid from uh, Western countries in terms of promoting growth in poorer countries, I think there's very good reasons to start with a pretty skeptical attitude about how much externally driven types of um, assistance efforts can really drive uh, domestic development. And then uh, the second is 
this narrative of state-led exploitation, this debt trap diplomacy is, is really not supported because uh, number one, you actually see that private firms are an important part of the increase in outbound FDI. And also you see that governance actually is important. So it's not like China, Chinese firms are seeking out the corrupt, poorly governed places to trap them, right? They actually are really within the constraints that they're facing and incentives that they're facing, they really are increasingly caring that the local governments have better governance and investing more, um, even the state enterprises. And so that seems very counter to this uh, kind of narrative. So let me stop there and open it up for questions. Let's see. Oh, you can see my whole email. Emails. I'm gonna unshare. Okay. Okay. From the Q and A box. So there's a question from the um, audience, the webinar audience. Are these considered FDI as IMF definition of FDI that are some controlling interest or do they also include infrastructure projects implemented by Chinese SOEs and funded by loans given to recipient country, which has to be paid back later? That's a good question. So the construction project data, a lot of it are contracts that Chinese companies have wanted to build the infrastructure. It doesn't mean it's their investment. Um, it could be paid for by the local governments with a loan. So that's why it's a separate, it's not really FDI. Um, it's a construction project, so it's a separate category. The FDI uh, definition, um, it's not strictly IMF. FDI actually is a pretty complicated, has a pretty complicated official definition. Um, and a lot of the regression analysis we did is for just greenfield FDI. And so it doesn't include a lot of mergers and acquisitions, which in some periods are quite a large share of the FDI. There's also kind of uh, brownfield FDI, which is kind of adding to existing greenfield kind of uh, projects. Um, but I think in terms of what we think drives local development outcomes, I think we often as economists are most interested in the greenfield FDI in different countries. All right. Are there any questions from our uh, our panel here, panelists here? Okay. Yeah, I have a I have two quick yeah. questions. Yeah. Uh, the first is have to do with the data sources you use for an analysis in terms of the FDI market data. Uh, market data. I have worked. I have worked with it a little bit, and I'm not fully convinced that, that is the best source for. Um, uh, measuring Chinese um, uh, outward greenfield FDI investment, even though we don't have many, you know, that many good alternatives out there. Uh, from what we have seen, there's some, you know, discrepancies between the greenfield data published by FDI markets and those released by international statistical agencies and the Chinese government. So I, I don't know if you have given some thought to that question. And also the, um, the FDI tracker, whatever it is called, uh, that data, right, if I remember correctly, only measures uh, FDI that exceed a certain certain right. amount, right? So, um, to what fair, extent? Fair, yeah, so those are good questions and fair concerns. So you're right, the AI data has a much higher threshold. It's really just larger product, product projects. And interestingly enough, if you add up all of the China tracker data, and it's just the large products, it roughly is equal in many years to the total amount of outbound FDI reported by the Chinese Ministry of Commerce. Although I don't think it should because it's actually missing a lot. So I'm not really sure about the discrepancy. The other thing though is the official data in China is also not very reliable because there is a lot of F outbound FDI which is not registered with the Chinese government. That has to be registered and there have been a lot of surveys in places. I, I, I remember a survey in Africa of Chinese firms where a bunch of the, especially smaller investments are, are, are just not, they're completely kind of independent of anything official. So uh, I, I'm not sure 
that the Chinese official data is a very good reference. And also, as I mentioned, it doesn't tell you about any flows to any specific country accurately because um, you know, all of it is going to Hong Kong. That's all they know. They don't know where it goes beyond Hong Kong in the official data. Uh, so um, it's not easy to use the, any data to really verify this quality. We've done some checking for certain, like in, in Southeast Asia where we've done a little bit, we've had a little bit more work. We've definitely found problems with the data, uh, certain projects that they say exist, we know aren't there. Angela actually probably knows much better than I do this, uh, the Southeast Asia data. Um, but so that's, but it's, it's the best we have. And so we do our best. That's all I can really say. Well, Albert. Yeah. Philip, Andrew Speed, you want to say something? Yeah. Yes, I always get worried. Maybe I've been around too long when people use the word private enterprise in China. Are you sure they are truly private and there is absolutely no shareholding from a local government or another local state owned enterprise? Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, that's I a tried good... to do this a long time ago, and it was very, very difficult to know who owned what. So it's a good question. No, you're right. Um, the definition that we're using now, so what we've done is we've linked it to um, Chinese firm registration data. And it will tell you, the firm registration data will tell you who all the owners of the firm are. And all we can do at a first pass is to see whether the largest owner or a majority of the ownership is state enterprises, but that's still inaccurate because even the ones who, that are not state enterprises, if you go to those firms, they could have state ownership. So there have been people doing work in economics that have done this very painting work to keep going back, the owners of the owners of the owners of the owners, and to try to come up at the end kind of what is the uh, state ownership share. And we're actually in the process of doing that for these data, mm -hmm. but we haven't finished it. So as a first pass, we've used a variable, which is just, is the largest owner a state enterprise? We've also tried it with, is the majority of the initial owner a state enterprise? And it doesn't really change the analysis very much. Uh, Albert, That's a good can point. I, can, can, Albert, can I chip in? Yeah. yeah you, your findings show that economic fundamentals uh, are less important as the determinant of Chinese o OFDI, while governance factors uh, seem to be a larger determinant. To what extent do you think that's due to a more explicit, deliberate consideration of governance factors uh, in the post-BRI period? Or do you think that's mostly uh, just an artifact? It's just, it's, it's just coincidental. Um, I think it's probably related to BRI, but of course, you know, it's so somewhat speculative. I mean, my view is that, you know, has been mentioned in earlier presentations that there is definitely a sense by a lot of firms in China, especially the bigger ones, that they should be involved in the Belt and Road Initiative. And so, uh, in fact, we know lo some local governments literally tell a lot of their standard prices, you need to do a Belt and Road project in some place, right? Um, and I think that, uh, therefore, you know, they're looking around and there are definitely some considerations that they need to consider that's not just like, what's the best place. Because sometimes some of them don't even really want terribly to invest, to be honest, but they kind of feel some pressure to do so. But in the context where you got to do something, I think they do try to steer towards places where they feel that their governance is going to not be crazy. I mean, because governance includes a lot of things like the regular, like the governance effectiveness, like, is it just a, do, do things work? Does the government work? Uh, but also political instability, these kind of things. So those are all governance variables. And so I can imagine in that context where you kind of, in, in a, a constrained optimization kind of a, where you have to do something and you're thinking, looking around, you, maybe you do focus on some of those things as, uh, those factors as uh, creating the least downside risk. I actually think that state enterprises now in China do have quite a strong commercial incentive to like avoid huge losses because, you know, SASAC uh, has the, the state agency that governs all the state enterprises. They've gone through quite a lot of reforms to try to provide stronger incentives for state enterprises to be more efficient. Um, which isn't to say, you know, they don't consider political factors and other things, but um, so that's my, my, that's my feel, but I'm not sure that's really that responsive to your question. Yeah. 
Anyone else? Albert, can I ask yeah. you a question? Sure. Um, I, I had some, I put some questions in the chat asking okay. about the definition of BRI country. Ah. Um, and you answered it in the course of the presentation, but you answered it by saying this is the 61 countries that were the initial focus of the BRI back in 2013 14, but then, you know, expanded to uh, East Asia, sorry, Eastern Africa and Eastern Europe. And then in 2015, it was opened up to every country on earth. So, and of course, they've signed BRI MOUs with countries as far afield as Italy. So does it really make sense anymore if we're trying to think, if we're trying to investigate the determinants of investment um, and so in, is the BRI non-BRI category the one that you've used? Is that really a defensible definition anymore? What does it really tell us when the Chinese party state doesn't define BRI in the same way that you're defining BRI? Yeah, actually I should say that none of the regression analysis this draws a distinction between BRI and non-BRI countries. All of it literally is the determinants of outward FDI to all countries in the world, before BRI and after BRI. BRI is only used to construct those descriptive figures about the trends in BRI countries and non-BRI countries. And for the data period that we're looking at, you know, right after the, I mean, 2014, 15, 16, you know, I think actually the 60 were more relevant so you probably see more action in those places. And it's also true that, I mean, the lion's share of huge investment countries are still the original, in the original 60. You know, like Pakistan and, uh, Indo, you know, like Kazakhstan. And, I mean, the biggest ones are the original 60. But, yeah, I mean, it's a fair point. We could try to change the description. But, uh, but I mean, uh, the regression analysis doesn't depend on any categorization. That's what I want main point I wanted to say. Uh, is this, um, this is published as a paper? No, not yet. <laughs> when is it going to be published? I'm desperate to read it. Uh, I don't know. We'll see soon, I hope. Okay. <laughs> Let us know, yeah? All right, I will. I'll, I'll, I'll circulate it to this group. Yeah, Min, did you have a question? I may be going over. Oh, yeah. You know, I'll be quick. So I think your data uh, actually, um, is very consistent with what I uh, argued in the in the book. And so when I compare the state companies and uh, private companies, uh, private companies uh, are much more vulnerable when they uh, invest abroad. So they are more dependent and follow the uh, government strategic uh, uh, programs. And so uh, they follow uh, leadership's visits abroad much more uh, tentatively and they also in my uh, interview data they just say they don't trust the host governments any promises but they trust the the Chinese government presence in that particular country. SOEs on the other hand uh, they have uh, uh, long established uh, presence abroad, lots of experiences. And what the, when they found that BI itself does not give extra loans, uh, the kind of lending principle is the same. And so they actually don't really, uh, their investment decisions are not particularly influenced by BI the signing itself. Um, but so I, I, I think your, your paper is very strong, uh, but, but I'd, I'd like to see whether you can come up with this, with uh, um, uh, explanations, you know, so hypothesis why that will be the case, because it's kind of contradi contradictory to our expectations on the behavior of state companies and versus private companies. Okay. And I, like Lee, okay. I look forward to reading the paper and I look forward to citing it. <laughs> All right, I'll give it some thought and maybe I'll follow up with you about uh, referencing your work appropriately. All right. <laughs>